Welcome everyone. You are tuned in to Hawthorne University's Holistic Health and Nutrition webinar series and I want to thank you so much for joining us as we welcome Julia Ross for her presentation on nutritional first aid during the COVID-19 crisis, overcoming depression and stress-induced food cravings with targeted amino acid therapy. Julia, it's so great to have you with us again presenting for Hawthorne. Well, thank you, Paula. I'm glad to be connected with you all again. Right, right. And you know, this is such an important and quite timely topic. So let me tell you a little bit more about Julia. She is the author of the international bestsellers, The Diet Cure, The Mood Cure, and The Cravings Cure. She has directed the virtual clinic for food cravings and insomnia in Mill Valley, California since 1988, where clinical nutrition is combined with clinical psychology, holistic medicine to address mood problems, eating disorders, and addictions. She works and lectures extensively and regularly appears in the media. Her clinic is also an advanced training center for health professionals who wish to acquire skill and certification in neuronutrient therapy. A little bit more about the presentation, because the people that are suffering from obesity and diabetes are at the greatest risk of infection and death from COVID-19. The stress and depression that is public health crisis has generated has increased the use of high calorie, low nutrient foods, making us even more vulnerable to the virus. Understanding the role of depleted brain neurotransmitters in this deadly cycle allows us to provide the specific nutrients that can quickly stop the cravings and the negative moods that drive both obesity and diabetes. So together we're going to learn to identify the radical dietary shifts that triggered the current epidemics of obesity and diabetes, understand how amino acid precursor therapy ensures client compliance with dietary recommendations, and learn how to quickly assess neurotransmitter and blood sugar deficits. And we sure don't want you to miss anything in this presentation, so we will record it and it'll be available for replay on our website in just a few days. We will likely go up to 90 minutes for this presentation. We'll follow that with your questions and Julia's answers. So please write your questions or comments in the webinar question panel at any time, and we will certainly respond to your questions, and I'll address them for Julia. I'm your host, Paula Bartholomew. I'm one of the founders of Hawthorne, and now it's time for Julia Ross. Julia, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. I'm so eager to learn from your expertise that's going to support us to understand and actually incorporate this information. So thank you so much for being with us, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Paula. And hail to the Hawthorne community. It's been a couple of years since I've connected with you, and the obvious new factor for all of us is the COVID crisis. Um, and that's why I asked Paula for the maximum time, the 90 minutes, so I'd have plenty of time to give you as much information as I can. And go back and forth at least you know for as long as possible to answer any questions that you have um, this is a particularly good time for me to talk for at least 90 minutes uh, or even 90 days because I'm right in the middle between completing the craving cure in 2018 and right now doing a revision of the mood cure that'll be that'll be published in in 2021 about March, the anniversary of the COVID crisis. Um, we had planned it ahead of time, uh, but it couldn't be coming out at a better time. Um, and these two books are going to give you the answers to any of the questions that I don't get a chance to answer today. They're both very detailed, heavily referenced, and uh, have very carefully designed clinical suggestions that you will be better able to uh, act on than the, the readers uh, on their own. It's written for readers, but the specifics um, are things that you are going to understand a lot better and be able to uh, carry into action uh, to help them get where they need to go. So. This presentation is being given in honor of those who are already suffering and those who are 
frightened about their own suffering and the suffering of others in the future. Um, and I felt called upon to talk about this, and I've been talking about this quite a bit over the last few months because this is my expertise. Um, and what, what I mean by that is that with obesity uh, rates already at 50% in the United States, um, we are no longer number one in the world because we have um, transferred uh, our eating habits to the rest of the world now. And so our weights are, we're actually at number seven now. Uh, but both obesity and diabetes are specifically and exclusively, almost exclusively, diet-related phenomena. And my expertise is in detaching people from their cravings for the foods that are creating these epidemics and propelling them uh, even more uh, during the COVID crisis, um, as you'll see. So here's a new craving cure in case you haven't seen it. This is the old mood cure cover, but it will be new in 2021. So we're going to be talking about both the increase in our junk food consumption and its consequences in terms of overeating. And it's interesting that the, the consequences are about 50-50 in terms of overeating and weight gain. So about half of us are overeating and half of us are undereating. Um, so half of us are gaining weight and the average is about 15 pounds. Um, but the other half of us are under eating and losing some weight. So this is very typical. And we're gonna be focusing on the overeating, which is a neurotransmitter deficiency problem um, that we know how to fix very quickly. The under eating is really a hormonal problem. It's an excess of cortisol, um, which always by driving the stress chemistry, um, eliminates appetite, in, eliminates sleep. You know, we are under pressure biochemically as well as circumstantially at this time. And a lot of people are experiencing this uh, excessive stress uh, syndrome. Mood-wise, and this is where the mood cure comes in, of course, um, the tools that we have uh, again, very fast acting uh, on the, the brain centers that are currently dysfunctional and depleted um, and more than ever, and you can see the numbers here, uh, the depression rates have increased 400% and that means from 6% of us to 24%. That's a huge increase. Anxiety almost as much, 300% um, increase. Um, the, the rate of suicidality now is 13%. We don't have statistics from last year to compare them to um, as we do with depression and anxiety, but uh, I think it's really terribly sad that the people with suffering the most from suicidality now are those who are caregivers. Um, the increase in addiction, the same thing. There's been 11% increase in addiction, which is very significant um, <clears throat> with new cases. And um, the existing cases you know, already uh, at epidemic levels, especially with opiate addiction, uh, are continuing. Um, so, and finally, uh, in terms of COVID-related suffering, the kinds of suffering that we can do something about so quickly with the tools that I'm going to be presenting with today, um, we've got insomnia rates, new insomnia rates um, that 15% of us are experiencing. So that um, another uh, enormous burden 
that exacerbates all of the above. Um, weight gain increases with insomnia, depression, anxiety, um, and addiction all escalate you know, under the, the burden of, of insufficient rest. So uh, we're going to make a change uh, in tone and historical uh, perspective. Uh, I always, whenever I look at this slide, I want to start singing, you know, I feel good um, because uh, we did. Uh, in the early 70s, uh, we felt great and it was a revolutionary decade, but in terms of diet, it was disastrous. And I want to talk about that because it helps explain the underpinning of why are we having such extreme re reactions to the stress that we're under now? And why were we already suffering from epide epidemics of obesity, diabetes, depression, anxiety, and stress before COVID? The dietary experiments that we embarked on then, um, totally unprecedented uh, and unexplored, unresearched, um, but the, the sales job that the scientists and the food industry inflicted on us uh, was very, very effective and we were in a revolutionary state of mind. And so we said, okay, let's cut the protein. Let's definitely cut the fat. That's, that's certainly responsible for the, the, the reasoning for this dietary experiment, which was that heart disease rates had been in, uh, growing since the 1930s and had reached a frightening level uh, by the 1970s. So we were willing to do whatever it took. Um, and so we did it. And you can see what radical changes in our traditional eating patterns um, were embarked on during this time and have continued to influence us all this time since. Um, so think for a moment about what uh, we had been eating for the prior two million years. Um, more protein, more saturated fat, and more vegetables, fruit, and fiber. Um, other than heart disease, we were not suffering from any significant diabetes or obesity. Um, our moods were good. The, the depression epidemic had not struck us. Um, we really had no, no universal reason uh, to cut foods in this radical fashion, especially the foods that had sustained us in our health for so long. Um, we had been eating saturated fat for millions, you know, hundreds of thousands of, or millions of years um, without heart disease. So it made no sense that suddenly the same foods would be causing the problem, but we bought it and we ran with it. And since then, those traditional foods that had sustained us in normal weight, normal mood, um, normal health, except for heart disease. We don't know whether traditional foods had anything to do with the heart disease um, increase, but we do know that in the 1930s, when it began, we had started to use trans fats, margarines, shortenings, uh, made from highly processed vegetable oils, omega, high omega-6 vegetable oils for the first time, instead of the saturated fat that uh, we had been using as our staple um, for, well, 10 to 20,000 years since we introduced dairy products. Um, so um, that's the, the, the real dietary crisis that is at the base of the problems that we're facing today. Um, so essentially the loss of our native appetite. You know, we went against our instincts. We've been eating according to our instincts um, for a long time. Uh, many thousands, and as I say, at least two million years. Um, our health 
has suffered terribly. This has not been uh, a health promoting dietary revolution in any sense. Our weight has suffered terribly um, and our moods uh, have deteriorated terribly since the 1970s. So all the statistics up to the 60s were very positive, except for heart disease. So I've already mentioned shortening and um, margarine, but let me mention the thing that is most likely to have accounted for our increase in heart disease, not the traditional food, but the new food. So uh, we have been increasing uh, our intake of sugar um, so that, you know, by the 30s, um, we were taking in about 100 pounds. Um, but uh, it hadn't increased really much. By the 50s, we were taking in about 120 pounds of sugar a year. Um, but now we're taking in 160 pounds. So um, beginning in 1970, that sugar uh, very likely uh, the cause of the heart disease epidemic um, has been allowed to increase um, while we struggled against fat, which was this phantom problem. Uh, it's been fascinating expose, you know, in 19, uh, uh, 2017 and 18, we, we heard, we learned about the payoffs to university nutrition experts um, to espouse the, the low fat option rather than the low sugar option. So there were very strong forces um, at work on both sides and the low fat people won. And here we are, um, not only have we um, lost foods, but here's what we've gained. Um, in the 1970s, uh, we started using free fructose. A high corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup. Um, so the free form of fructose is is quite different from the bound form, and the bound form is what we've been eating prior. Um, sucrose is um, a substance that's 50% fructose bound to 50% glucose, and we were except for cavities and probably heart disease, we were suffering the ravages of, of fructose increase pretty well right up into the 1970s. Um, but with the invention and proliferation of free fructose sugars, um, we got into a completely new era and you can see this extraordinary figure, 49, 100% increase. Um, so it was 50% um, of sucrose. At this point, of the 160 pounds of sugar that we eat every year, half of it is fructose in the free form, plus half of the sucrose that we're still eating. It's about 50-50, the sugars, you know, sugar uh, sweetened products um, are about evenly divided from between those that are uh, completely free fructose uh, and those that are sucrose sweetened for different texture, for different recipes. Um, uh, and because the uh, sucrose industry is fighting for its life. Um, so with Free fructose, um, we have a tremendous increase in addictiveness. So it's much sweeter tasting. Um, and so in large part, this huge increase in our consumption of it, it uh, what's responsible for it is its effect on our brain and our loss of control of our appetite and the increased cravings for uh, free fructose sweetened products. Um, we've, we've also, though, um, developed a number of fructose-related illnesses that are affecting at least 30% of the population. Um, 
So fructose intolerance is a completely new um, development affecting about 30% of us. Um, with unheard of types of um, arthritic conditions, joint conditions, new types of depression specifically related to fructose ingestion, and several other things that uh, are specifically known uh, to be caused by fructose injection, in, in, ingestion. Um, we, we, we know sort of endless things, frankly, at this point about the damage that this specific kind of sugar does. Um, one of the problems with it is that the body doesn't recognize that it's incoming. It recognizes when glucose is coming in but it doesn't recognize when fructose is coming in. So our appetite functions are not operating to protect us from this assault of free fructose. Um, we don't have the same blood sugar response to it. Um, one of the uh, most serious fructose related problems we're experiencing now is um, fatty liver disease, which again, at least 30% of the general population, 70% of diabetics, suffer from. Um, the liver is specifically uh, vulnerable to uh, this substance. Um, so I could go on uh, in terms of, of glycation and the rate of diabetes um, specifically uh, attributed to free fructose. Uh, but let, let me just say something very practical. High fructose corn syrup, of course, has been with us since the 1970s, but agave is new and agave has a higher percentage of um, free fructose than high fructose corn syrup does in most products. Um, fruit syrups do too, and they're becoming more and more concentrated. The, um, the fruit syrup sweetened sodas actually have more free fructose than colas at this point. And the, we're shifting towards the safer options, we think, and landing in even more trouble um, with the fruit syrup sweetened uh, beverages. So then uh, we, um, in addition to uh, adding this monster uh, to our diet, um, doubled the amount of, of processed starch that, that we'd been uh, accustomed to ingesting and more of it was white. Um, it was, it is, has been since the 70s composed of a new form of wheat, dwarf wheat, um, which uh, has never been studied in terms of its gluten content, its effect on us. Um, what we do know is that in addition to eating, you know, innumerable products made from it, uh, we are also um, being assaulted by, uh, those of us who are sensitive to gluten are being assaulted by lots more in these products because they're being added at a great rate to improve the texture and, as we'll see, the addictiveness of uh, wheat-based products. We are, we've already, uh, I've already mentioned the fact that, uh, we're in, that we've been inundated with, with these safer fats, which are in fact um, highly fragile, damaged, uh, deodorized, um, and uh, far too high in the omega-6 fats, which we only need a very small amount of, um, but it's become the primary fat uh, for the, uh, the human race, really. Um, it's so much cheaper than butter. Um, than olive oil, um, and uh, our use of it, uh, our use of fats, this specific fat, you know, being the one uh, that we're primarily using, has tripled. So in fact, we haven't gone to a low-fat diet. We've just switched fats, um, and the switch uh, is is known to um, be. A, a real factor in, in heart disease. Calories up 30%, that's no surprise. 
um, when we're looking at these highly processed carbohydrates, um, as you'll learn here today, uh, they have a drug-like effect um, on the brain that increases our appetite for them. And since we'd already made an ethical decision, a health decision, we thought, um, to stick with carbs and drop the high-fat proteins um, like eggs and cheese uh, and meat um, and the saturated fats, including uh, the, the cholesterol-free saturated fats like coconut oil and, and, and palm kernel oil, um, we really couldn't back down and, and the, um, the food industry was geared up for it. These are much cheaper supplement, uh, substances to use, uh, so their profit margin was way up. Um, and finally, uh, we introduced calorie-free soda. Um, you know, it was just barely with TAB getting started in the 1960s, but uh, you know, uh, by the by now, 20% uh, of the population uh, has uh, gotten into the habit, uh, literally uh, become addicted to to sodas. Uh, not only the caffeine content, but the sweetness. So it turns out that sweetness itself, even in the absence of calories, will trigger some of the same brain chemistry, create cravings and uh, add to the, um, the health problems, um, weight gain, um, diabetes, um, that the other sugar-sweetened, um, high-calorie foods uh, have, have, uh, have perpetrated. So um, this uh, sad state of affairs um, has led to weight deformity. These are unnatural weights. Um, the obesity epidemic was announced in 2000, but we saw it coming as we lost the ability to uh, become who we were genetically programmed to be in terms of weight and body shape. Um, so this is a tremendous um, tragedy um, in response to which uh, we did the only thing that we could think of and that the uh, nutritional uh, convention uh, recommended and that was uh, to embark on involuntary starvation. Another absolutely um, innovative um, occupation that was begun in the 1970s. Um, as we know, it's been entirely unsuccessful as a permanent solution. Um, Short-term weight loss, long-term malnutrition uh, instituted and uh, rebound weight gain, slowed metabolism, uh, no help uh, with weight and certainly not with uh, protecting us against degenerative disease. The diabetes epidemic was announced in 1995 um, in the United States and it's spread worldwide. Right now, um, China and uh, India have higher rates of diabetes than we do. We are at 50%. They are at 70 to 90% diabetes rates. Um, I've already talked about glucose intolerance and I'm not gonna talk about glycation because I would go on for too long, but if you want to know um, about it, uh, this is the secret illness uh, that is um, so much a factor in the death rate of di for diabetes. Um, I will go into it later. And of course, the other new thing was eating disorders. That The 1970s was the uh, genesis of our um, bulimia and anorexia epidemics, really. Um, some, you know, almost all uh, high school kids, for example, um, are doing major radical dieting, and that is one of the problems with dieting, is that it has triggered 
this um, eating disorder, full-on eating disorders uh, epidemic in this country, um, both bulimia and anorexia. Um, so uh, I'm left wondering, um, and I'll talk about it uh, a little bit later, but how we let this happen and continued on with it um, so that it's, you know, this whole dynamic is, uh, you know, poisoning the, the entire population. Um, all of these uh, problems, these consequences are affecting children as well as adults. Um, 15% of little children are obese at this point. 20% of teenagers are diabetic, and, and the, the child teen versions of diabetes tend to be more virulent even than the adult. So just for uh, comparison purposes, um, this was uh, a normal group of people, an average group of people in the 1950s. Um, ideal weights, no type 2 diabetes, um, very can-do time. We had just won World War II, um, and uh, we did it with this famous American uh, attitude. Uh, lots of singing, barbershop quartets really did exist. Uh, on the streets, whistlers, uh, it was a very upbeat population. And things changed in the 60s, but uh, not the things that we're dealing with now. Uh, we were up to under 20 pounds a year of sugar, but uh, weights were, and they were going up a little, but it was minor. Um, look at diabetes rates, 0.9%. In the 1960s, they didn't even uh, survey our weight. Prior to 1970, it wasn't. It was such a non-issue that that it wasn't even uh, measured uh, in as a public health issue. So now let's get to you know where we really need to be. Um, as 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 I tell my clients here at our virtual clinic uh, for food cravings. Um, the waistline is not it. You know, the, the center of our problem with overeating and weight gain is the brain. And it, really the brain is the center of everything else. Um, and it's not only food cravings and overeating that the brain controls, but also the kinds of moods. You know, are we positive in our mood? Are we negative in our mood? Progressively, our mood has been deteriorating since 1970, and those negative moods are part of the drive to eat drug-like carbohydrates that are going to change this brain <clears throat> chemistry, as we will see shortly. Um, uh, this is, you know, the the outside, uh, but what we're really what we're really interested in what's going on inside that brain, you know, what's making that expression, uh, what's making that glorious, radiant uh, smile. Um, and we're going to find out. Oops. Okay, so when I talk about high carbohydrate um, drug like foods, I'd like you to join with me in giving them a different name. These are not foods anymore. Um, and so I've proposed in the craving cure that we call them techno carbs. Um, this uh, toxic substance uh, is brain targeted uh, and it combines all of the foods that the food industry knows will change our brains and create cravings for their products. So it's important to know 
um, as I talk about this, that um, the uh, ownership of the food industry has gone through a shift um, and um, the tobacco industry has um, become very influential in the food industry now. Um, and as we know, the, the, the tobacco industry is solely a drug promoting industry and their entire efforts um, have been to make their products more addictive. Um, and uh, one of the things that they found uh, to be the most effective um, techniques for increasing addictiveness of tobacco was to add sugar and to inc add increasingly more sugar, specifically to get certain brain um, responses. And fructose is perfect for the task because it's so much more powerful, it's so much sweeter, so much more addictive. Um, but uh, glucose has a place, so sucrose is still in there. Often the two are combined, the free fructose and the uh, bound fructose glucose uh, type of, of, of table sugar, sucrose. Um, the refined starches, they are converted starting in the mouth. Um, Amylase converts them into glucose, so they have a powerful instant effect as well. So now we're combining free fructose, sucrose, refined starches. Let's say uh, one more thing about refined starch um, before we're through. Um, but before I get there, let's talk about chocolate, which is certainly... Um, tremendously addictive. And when combined with fructose, sucrose, sucrose and refined starches, we have one, two, three, uh, four times the impact. Uh, and then here's where I talk a little more in depth about the refined starches. They contain gluten, which is a protein. But in the case of this particular protein, unless you can digest it, we get a, uh, an opiate-like effect uh, from it on the brain. It plugs into the opiate receptors in the brain directly, and it's actually called gluteomorphin. So it's, it's been known uh, by science for a long time uh, as, a, um, as an opioid substance. The same goes for casein, uh, one of the two primary proteins in dairy products. So um, casein uh, is is actually called casomorphin. Um, and those of you, um, I have a family famous for their uh, ice cream addiction. That's the only thing. Uh, my family is very moderate eaters other than, than ice cream. Uh, and it's definitely got a, uh, an opiate uh, attraction. So when we add milk products to gluten, chocolate, refined starch, sucrose, and fructose, uh, the effect is multiplied uh, tremendously. Salt uh, is another uh, sensory pleasure stimulating substance. Um, and the, the more salt we eat, partly because it helps to balance out the flavors, uh, the, the extreme flavors that the other products are creating, um, we can get into trouble uh, with with very high levels of salt um, in terms of, uh, of, 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 uh, of our heart function, um, blood pressure. Um, we're adding caffeine, of course, to our sugar um, and uh, having our sugary, starchy, um, chocolatey things with our caffeine um, Caffeine is a highly addictive substance, um, and combining it with the sugar and the starch and these opioid proteins um, is a powerfully addicting uh, activity. And finally, um, we're, we're adding cannabis now. Um, and uh, as the founding director of the first uh, program in Northern California for 
drug addicted adolescents, um, I have been on the front lines of seeing what THC addiction can do to people and the kind of cannabis that's being added, the levels of THC, which were 0.5 in the 1960s, are now 60%, up to 100%. So this is an entirely different substance and uh, to add it uh, is clearly uh, to assault the brain tremendously and particularly when we think of the combination effect. Um, artificial sweeteners are not so much added, but they add their own brain targeted um, adverse effects to this whole picture. So uh, I wanted to take the time to go into what the components of techno carbs are, and they include some real foods. Um, Gluten is a real protein. Casein is a real protein. Salt is an essential uh, collection of minerals. Fats are essential. Um, of course, sugar, chocolate, caffeine, and cannabis are not. But um, altogether, in these very, very carefully constructed products, um, we have real food bombs, brain bombs. Um, so. When, uh, when, when Paula saw this particular um, uh, PowerPoint, she zeroed in on one word in it. So let's just go over it uh, because it's actually packed with important words. Um, and then we'll come back to Paula's, uh, Paula's word. Industrially designed, so very consciously and carefully designed. Um, obviously edible, um, edibles that disrupt uh, brain functions. And we're gonna talk about where those disruptions occur um, and where they occur is in the locations in the brain that are exactly where alcohol and drugs do, have their influence. They all plug into the same receptors. Um, and fortunately, the brain chemistry involved turns out to be relatively simple. Um, it's hard to put brain chemistry and simple together, but I promise you by the end of this presentation, you are going to uh, find this, this, this process and recovery from it simple. Um, so overstimulation is the name of the game. So we don't, we don't when we're designing Technocarbs, we don't want the brain to have the usual level of, of pleasure, you know. So an apple uh, stimulates pleasure in the brain, uh, specifically uh, endorphin increase. But that's not good enough. It, we, we don't really get addicted to apples. We don't have to have them every couple of hours uh, every day of the week. Um, so we need something that's going to stimulate the brain more radically. And that's what these particular substances do. And, and the, the, the effects of them can be seen in brain scans. So science is involved in this. This is not just a, a blind uh, uh, effort by the food industry. No, this is a very, very sophisticated effort um, to intoxicate us. So intoxication has you know, two common um, associations. One is to get high, you know, to, to be out of this world. Um, and the other is to be ingesting something toxic. You can see the word toxic is central to the word intoxicate. Uh, so the brain is, uh, is being assaulted by, by toxic substances here as they always are when, when the substance is addictive. That's the point of the substance. It has a per, particular kind of toxic effect. Um, so, and finally, um, and not so surprisingly, considering all the activity that's forcing the brain to uh, produce, these substances deplete us uh, of 
the very pleasurable neurotransmitters uh, that we rely on in, in order to enjoy anything in life. So, but that's the critical step in getting us to ingest more of these substances. If we're not depleted, we don't need them. Yeah, that was really fun, but let's get on with some of the other fun, fun things in life. No, um, it's critical that these substances deplete the brain chemistry of its ability to give us joy and pleasure, comfort, um, excitement, uh, and relaxation. So let's uh, so let's just focus a little bit on Paula's word, which was design. She said, "Are you? Do you really mean to say that these substances are designed to do this?" Yes, I buy the disruption part, but no, this is really the most shocking fact of, frankly, of life in the 21st century is that uh, so much of it is orchestrated by um, an industry that is determined to uh, addict us to, to products that they're very conscious are going to deform us and make us ill and kill us. Uh, and they are uh, very consciously doing this with infants. There is no commercial formula that does not contain sugar. And um, the American Heart Association just just two years ago um, published a study showing that infants who are exposed to sugar um, will become obese and diabetic as adults. Um, so um, do they know what they're doing? Yes. Um, and if if uh, you and, and Paula want uh, the um, very interesting um, proof of that, um, then uh, uh, please read a book called The End of Overeating, um, which is uh, about the food industry uh, and uh, with an, ins an insider author who quotes them saying, isn't it a shame that the very things that make our products so successful are also harming people. He wrote the book almost 15 years ago. Um, none of that has changed. So this is a, um, inten an intentional crime being committed. Um, and one of the heroes of the, uh, of the science world uh, trying to fight this is Nora Volk, how a neuroscientist and the head of the National Institute on Drug Addiction, um, who is very, very clear about the brain chemistry of these products and how they affect our brain and create the same kind of addictive cravings that drugs and alcohol create. So she was already a specialist in addiction and neuroscience. And then she had to face the fact that our foods are doing exactly the same thing, the same parts of the brain as the substances she was already an expert on were doing. So alcohol and drugs and these kinds of technocarbs, drug-like foods, um, drugged foods, uh, uh, had addicted, we figure about 60% of the US population um, up, you know, up to um, the 21st century. Um, and increasingly over time. Important to know that um, in addition to the depletion and the suppression uh, of our pleasure producing neurotransmitters, um, that sets us up for addiction to pleasure forcing uh, substances, stress um, combined with the influence of these substances further depletes us. So the, the whole point of stress is to make us um, stressed. Uh, so we, we, the relaxing neurochemistry has to go away. It has to be suppressed. 
so that we can face and act on the stress. Um, so COVID, um, because we can't act on it, you know, has this common, constant rather, um, stress producing, uh, but there's no end to it. You know, ordinarily there's a stress, we deal with it, it's gone, and our relaxing, soothing, pleasure producing chemistry comes back to the fore. Um, that's not happening. And this is one of the reasons that um, so many of us are under eating at this point, uh, because our stress chemistry is keeping us so agitated that we can't eat, we don't sleep well. Um, so very unfortunate consequence of continued stress over time. And over time, my understanding is over three weeks of continued stress, the new uh, hormone uh, release process becomes permanent. So we have more and more people who are stressed all night and not able to sleep well, exhausted during the day, which is a complete reversal from the normal, um, the normal uh, circadian rhythm, which is high cortisol, able to face the day, dropping down to very, very, very low and allowing us to sleep and do all the vital things that are necessary um, and can only be done without uh, cortisol releases. Okay, so getting further into the brain, let's talk about these areas that are specifically targeted by the food industry, um, by drug-like substances of any kind, uh, addictive substances, rather. Um, so I call them the great appetite and mood-regulating neurotransmitters because they are great. They're tremendously powerful and powerful for good if they're in, with us and you know, being produced by us in adequate amounts and uh, for great harm if they're not being produced in adequate amounts. Um, serotonin, our natural antidepressant, if we have plenty of it, we're upbeat, we're funny, uh, we're confident. Um, if we don't have enough of it, we don't just go into some sort of blank state. That would be much preferable to what actually happens when we're deficient in serotonin. We become frightened, worried, uh, sleepless, um, irritable, um, and depressed. Uh, so um, these are very well-known symptoms of serotonin deficiency and the same kinds of positive and negative symptomology um, depending on the production of, of, of all of these neurotransmitters. Um, it, this is all known, and this is what um, I'm proposing to you um, should be the basis of our assessment of our clients who are struggling with uh, craving and mood problems. Are, do they have the symptoms of positive function or negative? Optimal or depleted? Um, so I just gave you an example of, of uh, adequate and low serotonin, but the same is true of endorphin. Our, our primary sensory pleasure uh, capacity comes from this uh, marvelous neurotransmitter. Um, there are actually several types of endorphin, uh, slightly different and stronger or weaker, um, but they all give us what so many people need now, which is comfort. That sense of coziness, that pleasure, regardless of what's going on. Um, that uh, sense of well-being. Uh, if we don't have enough, then life is painful, we're, we're, we feel sad, lonely, teary, regardless of the circumstances. And now we have circumstances um, to warrant it, as well as a biochemical de depletion that our long-term uh, nutrient-depleted diet and our exposure to drug foods has landed us in. So uh, then dopamine is one of three very stimulating neurotransmitters, dopamine, norepinephrine, and adrenaline um, that we need for just to feel excited about life, um, to 
have well coordinated mus muscle action. Um, so to be able to focus. Um, so when we don't have it, we've, we've when we don't have enough uh, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, we're tired and we don't focus well, and we're not excited about life. Um, and finally, uh, GABA, which is our natural tranquilizer. We don't have enough. If we have enough of it, then hey, uh, we can we can rebound from stress. Uh, we can relax. We can meditate. We can pray um, with ease uh, most of the time. But if we don't have enough of it, our our ability to do those things is really crippled, and uh, we've got mental tension, muscle tension. Um, inability to tolerate stress and finally overwhelm. So that gives you the start of, uh, we're almost at the good news, but let's talk about the fifth target of uh, the, uh, the junk food industry, the techno carbs industry. Um, in addition to depleting our neurotransmitter functions, uh, it these foods are famous for depleting our blood sugar supply, and the brain's blood sugar supply is tenuous. Um, there is no stored sugar in the brain as there is in all the rest of the body. Um, so uh, we have to have a certain amount of glucose available to us um, at all times to prevent uh, real, tremendous problems with you know, our um, body control, brain and body control center, it's right up here. Um, so when blood sugar levels drop low, there's a whole syndrome of hypoglycemic moods, mental dysfunction, and sugar craving uh, for survival that gets triggered. And what happens with these highly refined carbohydrates, uh, the high caloric level that we're ingesting them, um, is that uh, we, the brain registers a huge amount of, of, uh, of glucose and fructose coming in, not fructose, sorry, glucose coming in. Um, fructose does eventually convert into glucose, by the way. Um, and so the insulin supply arrives to pull the excess out of uh, the, the bloodstream Oftentimes, and you know, over time, how many times can this save uh, be accomplished without compromise? So over time, the the insulin may take too much out, and the blood sugar drops too low, and our rebound cravings uh, as the blood sugar drops uh, become really overwhelming. So another major cause of of the craving for instant sugar is hypoglycemia in the brain. Um, so we're going to change stations again, uh, real time now, uh, and looking at the optimal brain. Um, and you can see these uh, glowing centers in the brain. Uh, think of them as um, totally optimal. Uh, neurotransmitter functions, um, sending out positive messages um, day and night. That's their job. Uh, so the, the good news, which is uh, what, what we're, uh, this is the good news uh, section of this talk. Um, we're in the brain. And we find that these five appetite and mood regulating functions in the brain, uh, the, the neurotransmitters and the blood glucose regulation, each one of them is simply, simply dependent on a single amino acid. Of the 20 amino acids found in food, essentially, we only need five. And we to correct the mood disorders and the appetite disorders that were, um, as a planet, uh, sinking under. Um,
So with that in mind, that we are, um, we really have a limited number of tools, doesn't take much. Every single one of these amino acids, these five amino acids, is readily available and inexpensive. Well-researched. Uh, so let's, let's learn more about it. And specifically, what we need to know is which amino acids is in control, uh, is the major fueler for which of these uh, five brain centers that should be generating positive moods and normal appetites. So how do we identify, first of all, which of the five is deficit, you know, needs more of, of, of its fueling amino, uh, which are, are doing fine as is, don't need an amino assist in a particular person. Um, when we see people and we assess their five, the symptoms of deficiency of, of each of the five um, mood and appetite regulating uh, chemicals in the brain, um, we um, probably run into people who are deficient in all five um, about 25% of the time. Um, probably about 75% of the time, um, they might have two, they might have three, uh, sometimes four um, neurotransmitter or blood sugar outages. Uh, but uh, but some people have all five, and it's not surprising. I'm always really surprised when they don't have all five, considering the diet that most people are uh, trying to um, fuel their brains with these days. Um, I found out about this work um, from neuroscientists um, in the 1980s. In the 80s, they were going out and speaking at conferences specifically for people in the addiction field to help us understand why our psychotherapy and 12-step based programs were failing um, under the new onslaught of, of cocaine um, in the early 80s. Um, but they had been accumulating their knowledge uh, really starting in the 60s, but in the 70s, again, this revolution, neuroscience revolution, we began to really understand what was going on in the brain. Um, and one of the things that was fundamental to neuroscience um, up through the 80s was its interest in how the brain was fueled nutritionally and which specific fuels specific parts of the brain depended on. So there's plenty of early, repeated um, research confirming, for example, that in order to raise our natural antidepressant serotonin levels, um, we primarily need just one amino acid, that amino acid being tryptophan. More on that later. Um, so. Uh, we started learning uh, in the 70s, you know, it was common knowledge. Um, in the 80s, um, it was less discussed towards the end of the 80s because it, by that time, uh, 1987, uh, Prozac was released. And a lot of the neuroscience research had progressively been uh, more and more funded by the, the uh, Eli Lilly and other pharmaceutical companies. Um, so they didn't want information about tryptophan known. They didn't want information about any of the other key neurotransmitter uh, fueling amino acids to be known. And uh, so the neuroscientists stopped talking about that. But uh, those of us who heard them speak in the early 80s learned about the amino acid precursors, as they call them. What is needed to build a neurotransmitter? An amino precursor, um, like tryptophan. So uh, 
in, in my clinical experience since 1988, um, we actually started using them in 1986, but it was in 1988 that I started my own program where I had freedom to use them with everyone. Uh, and not only with, with uh, alcohol and drug addicts, as I had been doing for a couple of years, but, but with food addicts as well. And more important to me as a psychotherapist, um, I could use them to relieve mood problems. Um, so since then, we've used these targeted amino acids therapeutically in over 5,000 cases, and we've documented them. And uh, at last, um, I'm getting around to publishing uh, the, the, this documentation uh, because, frankly, as you will see, you know, particularly in the next 20 minutes, um, this the results are so extraordinary, um, the tools are so simple and inexpensive um, that a lot of people, uh, and and I. And I imagine many of you are among them just can't believe that it's for real. Um, it's just too good to be true. Um, but I am very hopeful that you will take this information and run with it um, to help get the word out because um, I would be perfectly happy to do something else. Um, and I would have been all this time, you know, I, I didn't fall in love with amino acid therapy, um, I just couldn't find anything better. And I was an excellent psychotherapist. Um, I knew the value of psychotherapy, but I knew, I knew that nothing even close to the benefits of aminos, uh, the therapeutic use of amino acids was possible. Um, and I also knew that with the help of the amino acids, psychotherapy, is so much more successful uh, and so much faster to get through and easier to get through for, for our clients, you know, including the most heavily traumatized people. Um, so since 2004, I've been training people, um, uh, practitioner, health practitioners, and preferentially nutritionists because the diet, the dietary improvements have got to come right behind the amino acids, you know, if we turn off the cravings for junk food, there has to be an alternative very clearly in mind. Um, and uh, so for those health practitioners, there are many psychotherapists, for example, who are interested in getting this information and applying it along with their psychotherapeutic skills. Um, they, uh, they just don't know enough about diet. So we've had to add a precursor course, a precursor course, prerequisite course um, called Food Fundamentals so that they can give uh, you know, some basic dietary guidance um, and refer to nutritionists for uh, complicated cases. Um, but the reason I started talking about my trainees is that now there are hundreds of them who have had some level of training with me and are on board with this. They know uh, the secret. You know, they know that amino acid therapy is nothing short of, of a miracle in the face of the, the distress that we're surrounded with and that every practitioner face. There isn't a single um, MD who doesn't agree that 80% of the complaints, uh, even in the most basic um, medical practice, it has to do with, with uh, depression. Um, so they're dealing with something they have no training and no skill in dealing with. So uh, the good news has arrived, uh, and uh, this is the kind of response that we get within, uh, sometimes within moments, as you'll learn in a minute, but but um, within 24 hours, you know, we, we send people home with recommendations for amino acid. Um, therapy and they we had them call in in 24 hours uh, initially and we did that for several years frankly we couldn't believe it but the single most common 
report after 24 hours. We said, please call us after 24 hours. We want to be able to support you, adjust your dosing, whatever, if this isn't working. And the most common report that we got um, was three words long. This is amazing. And that's still true. So it's not an exaggeration to have these uh, happy people um, represent uh, the, the clients who have uh, benefited from amino acid therapy. Um, so what's involved? Um, the, um, the neuroscientist who did uh, the most uh, research, clinical research, um, and that was the most influential um, in the in the early to mid 80s uh, was Kenneth Blum, PhD, um, university professor, uh, massive researcher, you know, 600 published studies. Um, he was the only, still is, the only neuroscientist that I know of who was willing to break with the pharmaceutical industry and do research on the um, effects of nutrients on brain function and specifically on the, the functions of the brain that, that addictive substances were targeted at. So the four neurotransmitters and blood sugar uh, regulation. Um, he used low dose um, blends. So he combined all of the neurotransmitters that might be needed for an individual person. He didn't want to do high doses because it wasn't tailored. You know, uh, even with his low dose formulations, though, um, the the results um, were just astonishing. Um, we were in the middle of the crack cocaine epidemic, and he comes in in the early 1980s with a study that he did in a cocaine-only inpatient treatment program near his university. He had talked them into doing a, um, a study, um, a very simple study. He said, here are the neurotransmitter fuels, the amino acids that are required to repair the brain chemistry, uh, to restore neurotransmitter, the neurotransmitter function that's damaged um, by the ingestion of cocaine. And here's what I propose. You say that you have a 40% AWOL rate, that people come in, they put down $10,000, which in the, at that time was a huge amount of money, um, and it's non-refundable. If they leave, they leave the money behind. And still, you have a 40% relapse rate. I would like you to starting at a certain date, add this, you know, low dose, but very brain targeted uh, supplement blend to um, your, your regimen and have your patients take it several times a day. Uh, and then we'll reassess the AWOL rate at three months. They did that and they found that the AWOL rate had gone from 40% to 4%. So that doesn't mean that they had no cravings, that they were you know, completely fixed and that they never relapsed. But it meant they could at least stick with a treatment program and had a much better chance. Um, so that gives you an idea of the kinds of excitement that his research generated when he joined the, these conferences of, neuro, of neuroscientists that were lecturing all over the country to uh, addiction professionals. Um, we've taken, over the years, um, we've taken it much further because we have nutritionists on staff and we, we can um, individualize amino acid therapy. We don't have to give a blend and we don't have to give a standard dose. We can assess for which aminos are needed, when they're needed, and how much is needed. Um, so in the initial assessment session, we go through a questionnaire basically that's divided into five sections. You know, are, are you deficient in serotonin? Are you deficient in endorphin? 
uh, in dopamine, in GABA? Are you uh, suffering from hypoglycemia? Um, and once we know what their score, high scores, you know, over the uh, reference range um, are, then we take a look at, is there any reason that you shouldn't take one of these aminos that's indicated by your uh, neurotransmitter and blood sugar deficiency symptoms? Um, and there are very few to worry about, but each um, amino acid has a possible contraindication. Um, so we want to get that out of the way first. It's very easy to do uh, because it's a short list. As soon as we've done that, starting in about 1996, you know, so so this is you know 10 years after I started using the amino. Suddenly, I suddenly had the brainstorm. Let's uh, trial people right in the office because we were, you know, getting these tr in 24 hours. People were saying how amazing everything was. So. Um, we we started sort of informally doing it um, first with someone who was so depressed he couldn't talk, um, and so I just had him point at the deficiency symptoms that he had, and um, I gave him uh, you know samples of supplements to try, and it was very obvious this particular man was Native American, and we never found uh, any ethnic group more sensitive than, than Native Americans to these nutrients. Small amount, they feel it, you know. Uh, he lit up, you know, this guy that was so depressed he couldn't even talk. Um, so th from then on, we trialed everybody. They were coming to us, you know, from all over the country and uh, the world to see us and they'd spend, you know, three days, say, uh, and then go home and we'd monitor them on the phone. But we had them with us and so we began trialing. And that's what, you know, I recommend that to, to everyone. It's very easy to do virtually. Um, we have put together trialing kits so that um, we can mail them to our clients. Um, and in a, in a few days, they'll get them. And then we can set up the trialing session, you know, just a few days after the assessment session. Um, and sometimes we'll send them in advance, you know, and, and do it all at once, uh, the assessment and the, and the trialing. Um, so the trialing helps us identify the dose because some people are very sensitive, as this Native American man was, and some people, they don't really notice anything. And occasionally you'll get a negative reaction. But um, so by their response to the trial, we get a really good idea of the dosing. So we don't have to wait a week or so to um, increase if we've sent someone home with a dose that's that's too low, that's not really making a difference. We don't want them to feel that they're embarked on something useless. They've done so many things that haven't worked. Um, and the trialing is, is often a wonderful motivator because so many of them see right away which ones they need. And they can see within five minutes a difference in their own, um, their own mood state, uh, ability to relax, um, and, and also craving, you know, we can ask them, you know, before they start, what would you like to come out of this? Uh, and uh, and then in terms of craving, you know, would you like to be free of Cheetos or lattes or, you know, what, what's, um, and five minutes into their trial, we'll ask them, does it, you know, Cheetos or lattes, uh, ice cream, whatever. Um, appeal to you right now as it did beforehand, and they look blank and typically say no. So children need very small doses for a short period of time. Uh, adults, it depends on their sensitivity levels, which is what's so nice about trying. Um, so over time, we'll continue to adjust and then we'll terminate. This is not a permanent process. People do not have to be on supplements forever. Um, so. I said it takes it can take just five minutes during the trials, um, and we've done at least twenty thousand uh, of these immuno trials. So safety, success of them uh, is really guaranteed. Um, but 
if you you know recommend something to someone they go out and buy it and then a week later you talk to them that's that's okay um, uh, that's what we did for a long time um, it'll still work here's uh, one brain uh, the, this, the only brain scan that anyone has ever done this is someone who uh, was associated uh, her husband was associated with dr. Amen and he he uh, did a brain scan uh, and all of the red and white areas are abnormal function um, and they specifically show abnormal function in, in uh, the areas that, that uh, produce serotonin. Um, this is three months later. And you can see that all that whole archway at the top, the cingulate um, is no longer lit up. And, uh, she was no longer craving and she was no longer depressed. She ended up doing a, a special, a TV special. They showed her running after her dog and making jewelry and uh, and she attributed it all to the aminos. She'd already been in psychiatric, the best psychiatric care. Um, so speaking of serotonin, what do we specifically do if we have someone, okay? Um, I've already mentioned that we give them serotonin and we, typically start, in, unless they're very, very sensitive, we typically start at the standard doses available everywhere, 500 milligrams tryptophan or 50 milligrams of 5-HTP, whatever seems best for that particular person or trials best. Um, uh, it, it's very easy to become deficient in tryptophan, and so we, uh, we do a lot of tryptophan therapy. Um, going to go into that so much, but let's get into GABA um, and uh, our natural uh, de-stressor. Um, the, the GABA, you can see, starts with 100. That's the standard starting dose, or 125 milligrams. It's, it's uh, a little different than the others. Most of them start, the starting dose is 500, but with GABA, it's 100, and you can go up from there. Theanine is the backup. Uh, does, uh, you know, if GABA doesn't work, but brain's very familiar with GABA, but theanine, uh, you know, is only found in the tea plant. However, it works beautifully if GABA doesn't. Again, starting at 100 milligrams, going up as needed. Um, to, to raise endorphin levels uh, with our comfort food cravers, um, our, our, our sad um, mood sufferers, um, there are two options. One is slightly more stimulating, DL-phenylalanine. D-phenylalanine is more potent as a painkiller, um, but it is, is uh, not stimulating at all. So depending on what the person seems to need and respond to, it's nice to have these options. The same is true when we're trying to raise our energizing neurotransmitters here, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Um, for our fatigued clients, our unmotiv unmotivated and unfocused clients, um, caffeine cravers all, meth cravers, um, cocaine cravers. Um, L-tyrosine is a little more potent, phenylalanine is a little milder, both starting at 500 milligrams, um, typically a safe starting dose. For adults, we always um, give children uh, a fraction of the dose to start with. Um, those 14 and over uh, typically are good with adult doses. Um, those of you who know something about um, the communities of amino acid therapy uh, advocates who base their work on urine testing, um, I'm not one of them, um, also have very strong opinions about the, some things that we found to be totally wrong. Um, they feel that tyrosine and 5-HTP must be taken together in equal amounts. Uh, without regard to the symptoms or uh, obvious needs of, uh, of, of their clients. Um, so we always guide our therapy by the, you know, to individualize it by symptoms, um, no theories. Um, so for those hypoglycemic mood, mind, and <clears throat> uh, craving uh, types, um, the amino acid L-glutamine is the most remarkable uh, single thing. The uh, mineral chromium, uh, 
needs to be um, present to um, most people who have been eating primarily, you know, a high techno carbs diet are glutamine and chromium deficient and providing those things allows them to immediately experience normal glucose metabolism. And that includes uh, a lot of diabetics if they're not completely insulin dependent. Um, so um, I, uh, I just couldn't resist um, giving you this list. Um, it's so extraordinary. This glutamine is like the, um, the beloved nutrient of the medical world, the medical world. Um, lots of research on it, um, not only as uh, a source of instant glucose um, and just enough glucose to um, provide normal function, not too much. Um, it's, it's just remarkable um, for hypoglycemics uh, and many diabetics who are, of course, hypoglycemic at the time. Um, it's also famous, a famous immune enhancer and, and actually um, is the substance out of which many immune cells are constructed. The same thing goes for the GI tract. The GI tract is uh, the, the um, mucosa um, is glutamine dependent and is famous as a GI healer and probably a lot of you know about that, that use of it. Um, protects muscle mass. Um, there are just can't tell you how many studies of um, hospitalized, um, extremely ill people who can't eat, and by giving them just glutamine, either orally or IV, they don't lose their muscle mass. Um, so bodybuilders love it for that reason. Um, it is being used now as a medication, a pharmaceutical, to uh, improve uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, and uh, it's also being used in oncology to eliminate the neuropathy that's so often the result of chemotherapy. And I can, I, I have a, a best friend who lost a pianist, who lost the, the, uh, the first, the thumb and the first two fingers of her right hand could not, could not play the piano. And um, we gave her glutamine and it, it all disappeared. Uh, within 10 days. Um, so uh, keep in mind that so many of us and all diabetics are specifically depleted in this amino acid. Um, so um, we, uh, we are taking some action. It wasn't enough that, that these foods, that Coca-Cola was, was making us obese and diabetic. Um, but now that is killing us that the majority of those hospitalized are obese and diabetic. Um, Little Mexico is taking action. Um, the UK is um, launching action. They haven't done it quite yet, but they are very close to it. And this is world, literally world shaking um, for anyone any country to stand up to the food industry, the international food industry is extraordinarily brave, extraordinarily brave. Um, so let's, whoops, let's talk about um, some examples because I want to give you um, some, some real um, examples and it, it will only take a few minutes for us to, to, go, through, to go through these um, a few people. So this is, Lucy, um, 35, she's been binging three days a week um, for 15 years. She's been in OA or FA all that time. Prior to that, she almost 10 years as a chronic uh, low-level overeater, dieter, yo-yo weight person. Um, <clears throat> came in, did the trialing, didn't notice anything even though you can see her numbers from her first session in, in uh, February uh, were quite high. So the, the range is zero to 10. So her symptoms of deficiency in all five uh, brain uh, neurotransmitter and blood sugar categories were quite high. 
um, when she walked in, she did not respond to the trialing, so we knew that she needed high doses. She got no good, she got no bad, therefore we upped the doses and she went home with um, 5-HTP, glutamine, DLPA, and GABA, um, and uh, two or th twice or three times the starting dose, um, two or three times a day. And you can see that by the, the next appointment, um, which was later in the month, all of her scores were zero. She had no deficiency symptoms left. Um, and she said, I really don't feel the need of more sessions, um, and you'll have to be prepared for this response. Um, so we talked her into having one more, and sure enough, uh, still zeros. Um, she did call us. Um, we pro she promised to call us once a month and uh, that we could email her if we didn't hear from her. She did call and uh, has continued to be completely free of her symptoms, her cravings, and her overeating. Um, this is an older woman um, in her uh, late 60s. Uh, not not a not a food problem, but a mood problem. Severe worry, anxiety, insomnia, and a constant feeling of overdrive, and most of her adult life. Um, but she was she needed to retire. Her husband's health was declining, and she wanted to spend, you know, the rest of his life with him instead of being super busy the way she typically was. An incredibly productive woman. Um, so, in in this case. The, um, the nutritionist um, decided to um, add up the symptoms differently. So, um, it, but you can see that um, the, the low serotonin symptoms, you know, it's getting towards 100, it's very high. Then she had a few neurotransmitters that were really not a problem. Um, then it, there you go, GABA. So, Serotonin is soothing, GABA is soothing. This is a woman who didn't have much soothing going on. She had action going on. So she didn't need catecholamines, but that's the dopamine, norepinephrine, uh, because her energy was already great. Um, so you can see what happened with her as well. Her very, very quickly, um, her symptoms went down uh, very low. Um, this one was a little more complicated because of her ultra-drivenness. Um, we suspected that she had uh, something I talk about in the New Mood Cure a lot, um, uh, that she was on the mood swing spectrum um, and had a more serious um, brain chemistry imbalance in addition to the deficiencies. So we gave her a trial of lithium orotate. She immediately liked it, took it, and you can see that her... Um, Mood swings, which were mostly on the manic side, uh, went from tens, you know, within just a couple of weeks down to zeros and maintained. She also uh, had pyroluria, so we gave her zinc and P5P, a particular form of vitamin B6, uh, which we found um, in combination with the lithium is, is wonderful for people who are on this um, subtle bipolar uh, spectrum. You can see the pyroluria scores, um, 30 is the maximum, and she was at 25 down at the bottom, and you can see how they went down, 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 down. Um, zinc and P5P are wonderfully helpful, but they're slower to act in the, um, in the uh, amino acids. Um, so now we have um, a 12-year-old boy <laughs> um, who had been heavily addicted to THC for two years, this is a boy that prior to going to college uh, had, hadn't used drugs, was a star athlete, was a, a, a star emotionally, was a star um, academically, was a musical prodigy. Um, uh, but he, he went to college and uh, his first dorm roommate was a, a cannabis dealer. Uh, and so he got 
progressively uh, more into it. By the second year, uh, he had dropped out of college, um, was basically non-functional, um, couldn't even make it to his pizza delivery job. Um, and uh, just this this year, uh, this um, this summer, um, he uh, had to come home uh, because he was so non-functional, and his mother didn't really. She she brought him home. She didn't make any re requirements of him. Um, he was happy to eat well. He was able to sleep uh, somewhat better, but uh, when she suggested that she put him, uh, she was a, she is a, a trainee in, in my uh, early in her career. She took this on because she had to. Um, she put him on uh, the uh, the amino acids that should be listed here. There we go. Um, his uh, his trialing uh, and his responses were fantastic right from the beginning. Um, that he needed tryptophan, GABA, and DPA. Um, and uh, I want to go back to the beginning just to show you he was uh, like a lot of our male clients an underreporter in terms of deficiency symptoms. But you can see that day you know date one um, in uh, July he um, he was showing signs of problems. Uh, and you can see that uh, his symptoms went down very nicely uh, by the second date, um, second week. Um, the third week, uh, they were almost all zeros, ones and twos. Um, the fourth week, uh, pretty much uh, all zeros and ones. Um, the fifth and sixth weeks, again, zero, zero, zeros. Um, she continued to uh, give him the questionnaire and document the zeros, but uh, it's been right up to today. Uh, he, within a month, he had reapplied to college, uh, got back in, um, began to exercise in sauna, which is a very lovely way of, of uh, eliminating uh, hot from, from the brain uh, where it tends to store. Um, uh, and what he said immediately about the tryptophan was that he loved it for, for the ease it gave him and for sleep. And he continues to take uh, one capsule for sleep. And that's pretty much the only thing he's taking at this point. Um, he loved the, the chill of GABA because uh, he had not been a stress case until he started smoking pot. And then whenever he didn't have it, he would get very, very stressed. So the GABA got him past that, built up his GABA stores so that he could relax on his own. Um, tyrosine got him going again, got his energy up, got him back uh, to athletics. Um, he wasn't hypoglycemic, um, but he, he definitely uh, was, dependent on pot because largely because of its effect on his endorphins you know the pleasure that so many potheads experience regardless of reality um and the dpa uh replaced it you know he was able to feel pleasure again um so that gets us down to uh the end of his story you'll see on the left here that in addition to tryptophan gaba and dpa um uh, and, and, and tyrosine, that he, he was on a, a, on a multi. He was on fish oil and lecithin to clear out the linings of his brain cells, which is where the THC stores long-term. Um, so that was great. And when he combined that with the saunas and the exercise where he's sweating and detoxing through the skin is in addition, um, th that helps to account for how quickly he responded. That and the fact that it wasn't 10 years of addiction and he was a young, a young man. So um, I hope that this has given you a feel for um, what you can be doing, what, what everyone can be doing, really. My books are written for lay people, but I want you to know that particularly the craving cure 
two chapters I had you in mind, nutritionists in mind, chapters 11 and 12, which give the details of dosing, the details of contraindications, so that it's very clear um, step by step by step uh, that you have backup when you're working with clients. Uh, Paula, do we have any um, questions? We do. Thank you so much, Julia. This has been, you know, quite informative and, and ties it all together when you bring in your case studies like this. You can really see the drama of the improvement there. So thank you. Yes, there's a few questions and we have just a little bit of time here, so we're going to get right to them. A couple, well, a couple things I wanted to reflect on early when you were talking about the introduction of trans fats in the 30s and kind of a historical reference that I wanted to bring in was Sally Fallon's The Oiling of America. What a great piece that was. It is really such a strong historical reference of prior to the 1930s, we did not have heart disease until these substances were introduced. So if you've not um, been introduced to, to that piece, it's something to look into for sure. Oh, thanks, Paula. Um, yeah, sure. Um, one of the uh, questions here around the slide back on techno foods um, and recognizing fructose but not sucrose and um, and not having the same glucose response to sucrose is do you see this in an insulin response too? Oh, it's th that's that's a very good question. Um, I don't know if you remember, but I mentioned that the, the body doesn't recognize that it's ingested free fructose. Um, if right. it's not combined with glucose, the body does not release insulin uh, until later when the fructose has been converted into the more usable glucose. So uh, it's one of the reasons that it's so successful um, as, as a drug is that it... it uh, it disables our, our appetite regulation system in starting with, with the insulin response that isn't there. Great, thank you so much. Sure. A question about um, glutamine and all the beauty and all the value that it has to offer. Do you find that it causes anxiety in some people that have the GAD SNPs? Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, it, but but I, um, it's one of the reasons that we like the trialing so much because um, we get an immediate response, whether it's negative or positive. So we do get some people, a, a really tiny proportion of people, but who don't like it. They feel agitated, and we do um, identify them pretty quickly uh, as uh, being somewhere because of their. Um, dysfunctional brain chemistry um, on this um, bipolar spectrum and typically uh, rather than glutamine um, we can use chromium for blood sugar regulation and biotin as well both excellent we've used both of them in pretty high doses chromium at least a thousand micrograms uh, a day uh, up to two um, and uh, we find that using lithium orotate at these very tiny doses, typically along with the pyrolytic protocol, because so many of the people with genetic problems have the genetic condition of pyroluria that's part of it, uh, but can be corrected with, with uh, particularly with zinc and, uh, and B6. Excellent. It's good to know the, the, the alternatives for that too. And then a follow-up on the glutamine. Is it counterindicated in certain cancers? That is very much uh, in question because it's being used in oncology so much. Um, the, the reason that, that there's any question is that um, like all cells in the body, the cancer cells are made, you know, they, they, they run on glucose and uh, glutamine can convert into glucose. Um, but the, the pros are so much greater than the cons um, for the use of glutamine for all the reasons that I gave earlier that um, in general, uh, it's, uh, it's considered uh, essential to cancer treatment. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're um, the question back on the THC. Do you find the same concerns with CBD as THC? No, but it's very hard to find CBD without THC. Um, so uh, I'm frankly not satisfied with any of the research uh, that's coming out of the pot industry um, yet, uh, but I certainly get a lot of feedback about pain relief from CBD and mood relief from CBD. Um, but finding an organic, uncontaminated source of pure CBD is very difficult. Uh, there's a lot of deception going on in the cannabis industry um, where even organic products uh, have been found uh, to have contaminants like pesticides. Um, that, you know, that is, you know, the next step. Don't even consider it till you've ruled out the amino acid therapy. Then if you still need help, find a clean source uh, and, and try the pure CBD. It is, it, it is available. Um, it's, it's very difficult here in the legal market and how things are coming out. But in the legal market, they're so stringent, the regulations for um, no mold, no toxicants, no, no, no pollutants in it. They're tested widely. So if it's coming from a legal market, you have a better chance of it being a pure or product. And it's my understanding with CBD that you need just a little bit of THC to help activate it. Um, and so that's different than CBD and a high dose of THC, I would imagine, but just having it as a, as a cofactor almost. Well, the problem with THC at any dose is that it's a lipophilic. So it stores in the, the fat tissue in the brain and builds up. Um, so we, you know, it, there are sources without it, and I, I understand what you're saying, um, that some of them don't seem to work as well without some, but what that, does that mean? You know, if they don't work as well mood-wise, can you use the aminos instead and just use the CBD for other purposes? You know, it really, um, this is a whole conversation of its own, but um, yes, it is. Uh, the, the amino, there's so much money and press uh, towards CBD, and nobody's talking about the amino acids, you know, uh, which are much <laughs> more helpful. You are. <laughs> you you are. You're in the spotlight right now, Julia. All right. Um, you know, back to techno foods and the rise in these chronic diseases that we're seeing, like diabetes and obesity. What about Alzheimer's? I mean, it is a huge issue that's on the rise. I can't imagine that it wouldn't be a significant player. But what do you have to say about that? Well, uh, Alzheimer's is also called uh, diabetes three. You know, all all of all the diabetes are related to fructose in particular, um, and the kind of um, I talked about glycation earlier, um, and most people don't even know what it is, even though it's the primary driver in, in fatal conditions like Alzheimer's. Um, so when glucose, and particularly fructose, is in a free form, circulating in the bloodstream, uh, the, the cells that, that, that these substances come in contact with are damaged. And that's particularly true in the brain. So it's at, they're actually lethal, you know, uh, substances uh, doing tremendous amounts of damage. Um, and uh, and glycation is the name of this collision caused uh, illness um, that that sugars, particularly in the free form, can. Uh, and are setting off in epidemic levels. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to close with a comment on um, the edible slide and the distrust word <laughs> that, that came up in that, right? Um, distrust, disrupting brain function here with the edibles, um, and was it intentional? I certainly uh, reflect back on how in the 60s, 70s, 80s, we really challenged the cigarette industry for the heavy pollutants and tremendous addition of chemicals that they were putting in and proved to be intentional 
to, to provoke um, addiction in it. And so I, I get it here that industry can be sinister in these kinds of things. In terms of the end of all reading, I do encourage it as a reading. I read it back in the time when it first came out. It was on recommended book list um, on Hawthorne's at the time. So it's, it's a very revealing read. All right. Um, that's the end of the questions. I have some few just closing comments here. I want to remind people that the webinar was recorded and it'll be available on Hawthorne's website. You'll find it under archived webinars in just a few days. There'll be a survey to fill out after the webinars end, and it really helps us to have your feedback and any comments about this presentation and series. So we sure appreciate you taking the time. And Julia has very generously offered a copy of her book as a giveaway. So one, which book are you going to offer there, Julia? The Craving Cure. Right the on. newest book. All right. The newest book. So fill out the survey. One lucky person is going to be selected to, for the book giveaway. All right. Our next webinar is September 15th with John Romatowski. He's presenting on the role of endocrine disrupting chemicals in childhood obesity. It's a great follow to this, Julia. Yeah. Our next All About Alumni graduate interview is tomorrow, Wednesday, September 2nd at 12 noon with our um, master's graduate, Laura Kopeck. She's going to be presenting on her postgraduate activities, accomplishments, and her challenges. This will be a good one to tune into. We've had so many previous great grad interview presentations, so check those out in our, our archives, too. I sure hope we've inspired you to learn more about health and nutrition with this presentation and all the previous webinars we've done over the years. And remind you that Hawthorne provides a variety of nourishing programs and courses. So I sure encourage you to visit our website for more detail. And when you're ready for more personalized touch, our admission advisors will be right there for you. All right. This concludes today's presentation. I'm certainly grateful to James Bernard Nelly, who I get to work with on a daily basis, but he also engineers these webinars and keeps everything moving so smoothly. So thank you, James. And thank you again, Julia. It's, it's just been a pleasure to have you here. I want to thank everybody for sharing this educational experience with us. I wish you all the best of health. I sure look forward to learning more together at Hawthorne in our webinar and all about alumni series and for all our students and their programs, too. Until then, till we meet again, I'm going to continue to mine my amino acids because it matches it matters so much, as well as happiness and compassion. So what we practice grows stronger, right, Julia? Let's get right. strong. Let's get <laughs> – let's be our best selves. All right, everybody. That's it for now. See you back here soon, I hope. Take good care. It sure matters so much now. Thanks again, Julia. You're welcome. Thank you.